is Wayne Suyanaga. I have brought a bird pin that was created by my grandfather, Hanzo Shimokawa, of at that time, the island of Hawaii. And he did this in, I would guess, 1944 or thereabouts, in one of the camps that uh, he was at. Uh, my grandfather immigrated to uh, America around the turn of the century. And he was an aspiring artist, but through various turns in life, he uh, got married in Hawaii to a Japanese a woman who was already there. And both of them became a principal and teacher at uh, uh, a small Japanese language school on a plantation village in, on the Big Island of Hawaii. Because he was involved in the community, both as a teacher and then, you know, as a leader in the community, he was also responsible for many of the dealings with uh, his, his uh, people, with the uh, uh, Japanese consulate. Mm -hmm. And because of that, he was under watch in the years before World War II. And because of that, after December 7th, in fact, the next day, he was uh, detained and interned and was put in a series of uh, camps on the U.S. mainland for about four years. There were camps in Louisiana, in Missoula, Montana, and in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm not sure where he made this. He made some other objects, but um, you know, these bird pins were popular um, things to, to make in many of the camps. So this was done there. There are others that uh, he has and other family members have that uh, may have also been done in the camps, but also when he returned in, uh, returned to Hawaii. His family stayed in uh, Hawaii, and it was hard times for them because you know, the breadwinner was, was gone, but uh, my mother, for instance, was a, a teacher and, and had just gotten her teaching degree, and you know, the community, I'm sure, helped a bit too. But uh, no, he was there for the duration. Well, he wasn't uh, officially allowed to teach again, so the family moved to Honolulu. And eventually he did teach in a language school in Honolulu and for another 15 years or so. Um, he was always interested in art, even though he couldn't practice it uh, you know, professionally or full time. And we have some paintings of his from uh, before the war and after he retired especially, he did a lot of drawings and paintings. But uh, this is something he loved to do all his life. Well, this particular piece, the piece itself, I don't know its history. I'm fairly sure it was done in the camp. For instance, the pin on the back is a uh, regular safety pin. Others he had, has made had the you know, fancier jewelry type back, backing. Uh, I came into this, my wife and I came into this just last year, and we didn't really know about it except some some family dealings, and all of a sudden people said, oh yeah, these pins, and you know, many of my cousins have two or three, so but this is the one we have. He might, I might have, and it would be surprising if he didn't, because I think he, they had some materials, but I'm not aware of any of his paintings in there. He did, of course, a lot of work, and he said that a lot of his work, both before and after the war, especially, he gave away his gifts to, you know, at weddings and special favors. So he was quite prolific, and we have the family has a lot of his paintings and drawings, especially from the time after he retired. Like a lot of the, the internees, he didn't really talk about it very much. One of my aunties was very persistent, and he finally had an interview with him that we have a recording of and a transcript and we learned a lot from that and his, his time in the camp. He viewed it as, as uh, well, I guess in the best way, he viewed it as, as a way to see America, which he always wanted to do on those long train trips in Louisiana and Montana and, and New Mexico. He said, well, I saw a lot of the country. so. But on the other hand, he never became a citizen, like my grandmother did. 
who was very patriotic. And my auntie said, well, I think that was his way of his protest. But there was no uh, bad feelings that he transmitted to any of us. This was just a recent uh, acquisition of mine. I think more important was the only thing I kept from him after he died was a piece of petrified wood that he had brought back from uh, must have been standing in New Mexico. And that's the only thing I'll keep from him because it's, it really embodies his you know, perseverance, his solidness, his uh, way of going about things. And so when I see that, I, I, I remember. But this is something he, I, you know, he just picked up along the way. I don't think he might have been involved in the polishing of it. That I don't know. You know, some people might say, well, you know, he had the other all this time, but then why did he have this time? Mm -hmm. He was being taken away. He couldn't support his family. There was communication between, you know, the family and him, so it wasn't like they didn't know where he was. On the other hand, it uh, was a difficult time as far as just living the day to day for everything. So all of these things are say embodiments. The art itself, well, it was something to do. And he and it was a release of his say artistic talents. Mm -hmm. But other than that, yeah, well, that's what I mean. Uh, eventually, you know, involved a move for the family to Honolulu. Oh, he lived with his uh, as a family, but many of them had already gone off. I think they were involved two of the youngest daughters who are still living there. And eventually um, they settled in from Kalihi, they were moved to Kaneki. And there, that's where he lived up the rest of his life. Now, I remember him as just a very gentle, gentle man. Um, he wasn't one of these teachers who, well, I, th I take that back. I think he was very strict in his teaching. But of course he didn't show it in his family. But he would, very gentle spoken. He was interested in gardening, he was interested in, in the painting, and he would just go about whatever he wanted to do in a, in, in a manner that got things done. And he would never um, boast about anything. Well, he, you know, he didn't speak that much English, so I didn't get to speak with him too much in depth about anything. But even about his uh, camp experience, you know, like I said, it took a while before one of my aunties was very persistent to sit down with him and, and uh, interview him. And she was uh, also uh, transcribed that. And she was also very persistent in getting a friend to get a copy of his FBI interrogation, which also revealed quite a bit. He was like I said, he never became a citizen, but at the same time, even before the war, he would tell people that, you know, in the build-up, he could see the build-up of, of uh, animosity between the countries. He would tell his students, look, you're here in the U.S., you're in America. This is, uh, this is your home. So, he was very uh, constant on being doing the honorable thing.